I'm Reverend Phil, and I'm your host, Words of the Prophets. Where are our prophets now? Where are those messengers God chooses to communicate divine revelation through? In the past, the Creator sent prophets like Abraham, Siddhartha, Jesus, Muhammad, and many more. Maybe our higher power has switched tactics since we reinterpret God's words as soon as the Creator's prophets leave us. Could it be that Spirit talks to each one of us individually and we haven't learned to listen? On Words of the Prophets, our modern prophets show us how to find the internal prophet that is the I Am, and we discuss the application of spiritual principles in all aspects of our lives. Love and light, everybody. I'm Reverend Phil, and I'm your host for Words of the Prophets. Sitting on the far right is my good friend and co-host. You all know him by now, John Monroe Castle. Hello, hey, John. Hey, Phil, Phil, Phil. Nice to see you again. Good to be here. And today our guest is Shubraji. And those of you who were with me back in radio days will remember her. We did a show about a year ago, and she's back in town and wasn't turned off by the experience, agreed to come on TV this time. Thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting me. It's good to see you. Good That's to see you. good to have you here. Uh, Shubraji is a disciple of His, Hol His Holiness Swami Chinmayananda, who is the founder and head of Dhamma, right? means to prostrate or to surrender to the divine. Did I pronounce that right? No, Swami Chinmayananda is my teacher. Is your and teacher? I'm the founder. You're the of founder. Dhamma. Okay. Phil, you got to get yeah, these things that's right. Fine. Yeah. And there's a Vedanta center up in Woodstock yeah. where Shubhraji has heads it and teaches there. Today's prophetic topic is living it with love, and this phrase is part of a quote from His Holiness Swami Shimi Chinmayananda. The quote reads as follows, one may realize the truth throughout knowledge and contemplation, but the fulfillment of that can only be by living it with love. And that's what we're going to focus on today, is about living it with love. We're going to talk about Hinduism and how to put it into basic applications in your daily life. But before we do that, I want to let you know that we are going to be well, honored with Shubhraji teaching us for about three weeks. So we're going to have Monday, July 13th through Thursday, July 16th. They're going to be morning sessions from 7 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. And they're going to be on the Mundaka Upanishads. And this is going to be taking place at the Vedic Chant Center, 901 West San Mateo Road. Number is 983-1781 and it's extension 2. And we'll give this information out later. And then later on in the month, Monday, July 20th, and Tuesday, July 21st, and then again Monday, July 27th, and Tuesday, July 28th, we're going to have evening sessions from 6 to 7.30 on the Bhagavad Gita, Chapter 12, which is the Yoga of Devotion. All of this is free. Donations are welcome. Show up. It's, you're going to have an incredibly spiritual experience if you show up. So with that... I'm going to shut up. And <laughs> tell us a little bit about your story. Tell us about you know, Swami Chinmayananda, how you became the teacher that you are today. Well, I met my teacher when I was just 14, and I wasn't looking for a teacher. I was not spiritually inclined, or not that I know. And it was a chance meeting through my elder sister, and something struck a chord in me his love and his intelligence, his dynamic style of delivery, and above all, the content of what he was saying is that we are all divine, that we are all connected to God and all things at the same time. And from that moment, this bond developed. And as I was growing up and studying and doing my life, it became a very integral part of me and my day-to-day -day life. So I just kind of moved into it. I studied with him, and he left his body in 1993. And then slowly over the years, uh, what I had studied stayed with me. And one day when I moved to Woodstock, New York, I just started having these small gatherings, and that's how it all evolved. Tell us how you wound up in Woodstock. Oh, again, I have to say, it's always the hand of the teacher, the spiritual master, and I had met somebody with him, one of his devotees, who's also a minister. 
interfaith minister who was now living in Woodstock, uh, Bella Salerno, and we had met 14 years ago in Pittsburgh <laughs> while I was traveling with my teacher and serving him. And we reconnected after he left his body, and I heard that she's doing spiritual teachings there, so I started visiting, and I loved Woodstock. And after a couple of years, I just decided to move up there, and that began my Woodstock chapter. <laughs> Lovely place. There are many ways people make it to Woodstock, yes. depending just, on what year it is, right? <laughs> just like a lot of ways people make it to Santa Fe. Um, you said something which I thought was interesting. Um, up until the age of 14, you had not heard from anybody that we were divine beings. How come? Well, the fact of the matter is you grow up in India and you grow up with this teaching by osmosis. You don't really know it. You're not told in so many words. At least that was my experience. I grew up in a, a conventional household and I prayed. We had a little temple in the house. So we have this concept of God. But the concept of God at that time is that God is separate, supreme. Whereas later, as we unfold in our spiritual path, we realize the path of uh, the teaching is that we are all one and we are divine. I have a question. You said um, an interesting phrase uh, when you were 14, by chance. Yes. You really think it was by chance? Well... I wasn't looking for it. Nothing is by chance. Yeah, There's no coincidences. Exactly. But to me, it seemed at that time it was by chance. And, and that's a very good distinction yes. that you make because we often don't recognize uh, the the incoming of our, of divinity, the upwelling of divinity. But divinity is always mm -hmm. there. It's, mm -hmm. as you said, we have to recognize it and we have to uh, move our attention towards it. We become conscious of consciousness. And that's the only difference. But consciousness is always there. It is. And 14 is an interesting age. Yes. Um, can you say what happened at 14 that would be a kind of a catalyst for that awareness? Well, nothing happened at 14. But uh, I lost my father when I was younger at 8. And so I kind of became atheistic. And uh, my elder sister, who's about 16 years elder to me, she is uh, very spiritual and has always always been seeking and searching, or was at that time, and she had just met uh, Swami Chinmayanand, who was later on to become my guru. So she said, I would like you to meet him. And I said, I'm not really interested, you know. And she said, no, just come once. He's very different. And well, that's how it all started. It's wonderful that it starts with invitation. Yes. There's a certain hospitality of divinity yes. rather than forcing. Yes. You know, forcing us to be compliant, it's rather inviting us to be participating. Yes, and I feel that this is something that happens when the time is right. Yes. We yes. can't, with our limited intellects, you know, presume anything. It will happen. Actually, it is said in our scriptures that when the student is ready, the teacher appears. You know? And does that require the student to have an awareness of their readiness? I think not at a conscious level. But there's so much going on at a subconscious, unconscious, or what I should say, a deeper level of the personality that we can't even fathom it. So uh, if you follow the basic Hindu principle, we have the law of karma. We have the idea that we are born into a specific environment to exhaust and to play out certain uh, inclinations, good and bad, spiritual, not so spiritual. And so it is a process of evolution. And in that process of evolution, when the timing is right, things just happen. That's amazingly hopeful uh, for me because it doesn't require our conscious awareness to begin a process. Rather, the process has already begun. Well, the process starts uh, in, in, we believe, even before you, know, you are born. So the teaching also starts from the womb. And the whole Hindu philosophy or the whole of Hinduism is, uh, you know, really geared with that at every step of your life, at every stage of your evolution, you are connected whether you know it or not. And certain rituals and certain things are just incorporated into your day-to-day -day life. And a lot of people do them without understanding, but they still bring you that result. They make your mind quiet. They make it attentive. They turn it inward. 
So in Hinduism, is there such a thing as free will? Well, how would you define free will? Well, not that I even would define it, but let's use it as an example. Suppose you decided to go along with your sister to meet who was to become your master and then decided, that's a waste of time. And you don't do that. I mean... Of is, course, is that, is I have the will to get up now and walk and you have the will to, you know. Yeah. There is free will, but free will, if we really see, is conditioned by our own thought, isn't it? Our pre-existing thoughts condition our free will. And the pre-existing thoughts are something that we have. And those pre-existing ideas manifest certain external circumstances. And within that circumstance we exercise, man has free will, limited free will. That free will, because my thinking is based on who I am, and who I am is based on my belief system from so long ago. I'm not even bringing in reincarnation, just from this life itself. Mm -hmm. So when I have the free will to do something, my thinking and action is correlated. My action is based on my thinking. My thinking is based on the sum total of who I am. So my free will becomes limited by the sum total of the memory within. Do you recall having a deeper feeling when your sister made you that offer? Do you recall having a deeper feeling no. when you heard His Holiness speak? I was resistant. Yeah. The little rebellious teenager was resistant. So consciously, I didn't know what was happening. And I just met him, and I found my teacher. He had this electric personality, very dynamic, vivacious, six feet tall, laughing, joking. And there was something about him where he met each person in the room with so much love that I just gravitated. And in that moment, there was no reasoning, there was no thinking. You just knew. I just knew there was something I liked. And within the next three or four days, I just connected very deeply with him. That's interesting to me that at a conscious level, there is what you call limited free will. But in the larger sense of who we are, free will isn't even necessary, is it? Well, this is, I think, a very long debate because <laughs> yeah. we need to go into its two sides of the same coin, mm -hmm. what we call destiny mm -hmm. and what we call free will. Mm -hmm. Destiny is nothing but what you confront. But what you confront is not independent of who you are in the past. Your destiny in, as a medical doctor is because you have invoked medicine in the past. So destiny is nothing but your thought, thought by thought, action by action, we build our own destiny. We are the architects of our future in that sense because man has intellect. So you can say as long as we have intellect, yes, there is some choice, but our choices are self, by themselves conditioned. You know, it's not that we are all on automatic. There is within a given thing free will. Choice is there. If I were to make the statement that if it wasn't for free will, there would be no karma, what would you say to that? If there was not no for free, free will, will, we wouldn't have karma. Well, you see, again, this is such a topic. To be honest with you, I don't know if I can do justice to it on this program. In, we don't believe in the little things. We like to go for the good okay. things. Okay. <laughs> karma, karma, the word just means action. Let's, okay, so I was just saying, let's yeah. define that. Yeah, so karma just means action. So man, the roof and crown of creation, has more intellect as a species than the animal be, to make the power of discernment intellectually than an animal, than the plant kingdom, than the stone consciousness. So our actions are governed by our thoughts. Our thoughts are governed by the values we entertain. And that's what I'm going to cover in the Bhagavad Gita. So we are informed by what we believe in, the values we entertain. And the thought is the father of all action or the mother of all action. So karma means any action that is done, you get a tangible result, but you also get an imprint. You get a residue. You get a result from it 
which is stored in your psyche. And that, again, needs to play out. Cause and effect. Cause and effect. Okay. Let's let's keep explore. I'm not to keep exploring this. I don't want to keep beating this thing. Okay. Um, let's get into some basic Hindu beliefs, its origins and such. Hinduism is not a religion. Hinduism is a way of life. It is not founded by any one person. It has not got one founder. It didn't happen just at a moment, but it is an evolutionary thought or philosophical process and it has been integrated into the way of lives of Hindus. There is no such word even as Hindus. Actually, the masters, the contemplative people were living by the banks of the river Sindhus and the Europeans came and the Persians told the Europeans that go, there is a very contemplative, very intelligent kind of people living by the river, Sindhus, but in Persian they can't say S. So they said by the river Hindus, and that's how we got the name. <laughs> so Hinduism wow. believes in one absolute reality. There is one energy, pretty much what quantum physics or physics also says, there is one energy. However, this one energy has manifested into so many different names and forms, just like the gold, in all the different gold ornaments, the name and form is different. And Hinduism developed over a period of thousands of years, and then they incorporated certain things to make the people connect deeply with this one energy. And so they deified, and they had different aspects and different gods and goddesses with which people could connect because it's easier for the mind to connect with a form, you know, with a symbol. Sound symbol was Om, and, and so forth. And so Hinduism developed slowly. It is a revelation to the masters, the mantras, the sounds, they just came. And slowly it developed over a period of thousands of years. You were talking about the river. Um, how does that tie in with the Himalayas? Well, the Himalayan mountains uh, the snow-capped peaks is where the masters were sitting and they were meditating full-time. These were rishis. And they had one quest, and their quest was, who am I? And this is the basis of the Vedanta philosophy, which is the root philosophy of Hinduism. Vedanta and Hinduism are not two separate words. And people often get confused. Vedanta just is the name of the philosophy. Vedas means knowledge, it comes from the root word vid. Anta means the end, the culmination of all knowledge. Mm. So what is the greatest knowledge we can seek? These masters were reflecting deeply. And in the white heat of their meditation, they had these revelations. So the scripture is a revelation. And these revelations were given out as the Vedas. And the mystical revelations are called Upanishads, the teaching. And primarily, the teaching is, who am I? What is this one consciousness, which is the substratum of the whole creation? And how can I have a deeper understanding of myself? What is my true nature? And if I'm seeking happiness, which is what we are all seeking, is it possible I am the source of that happiness? So understanding your true nature became the main, um, what you call, pastime of these masters in the Himalayas. You, two comments, two, two phrases you used. First one, you talked about white heat. Can you explain that? I'm just using a phrase, white heat. I mean that they were in contemplation in a very pure state of mind and heart where the mental clarity and the, the, the agitations were not there. They had studied life. They had seen, they were subjective scientists. And so their movement from the outside, the external, into an subjective, internal, inner state of being. And so in that, I just use the word white heat. It is a contemplative state. Every religion talks about that state. You know, that inner peace, 
-hmm. that purity, the peace that passeth all understanding. And in that state, your logical mind, you have transcended because what they were seeking was, what is behind this mind? I see I'm upset. I see I'm angry. I see who is the one who can see this? Is there something more? Am I something more than my emotions? Because today what is happening, and you said we're going to talk about the practical, this is the practical, we are run by our emotions. Mm -hmm. But we have to understand, if we make a deep, and that's why it's called a self-inquiry. Who am I? Am I something, am I aware of my emotions? Am I the emotion or am I the awareness? And that becomes contemplation. That becomes meditation. So if I am the subject and I'm something separate from my emotions, it's not that can I control my emotion because, because control implies force. Control may also bring suppression, but can I watch my emotion? Can I surrender it to a higher ideal, God, you know, the divine? Can I just let it be? Can I transcend it through this process? That, is the, that was the method they followed. And I like that word transcendence because we've talked about that on a number of shows where if I understand your use of that word, then we're not getting too much into duality. There is a lower part of me that will exist and will continue to exist, and I don't make it go away. I raise myself above it. I get into a higher level of laws, a plane of existence, where I'm no longer ruled by those basics. True, but it's like, as a child, I'm very attached to the toys in the toy shop. And as I grow up, as I transcend, I don't have to have that attachment. That attachment drops off. So once you transcend in a very natural way, you don't consciously make that other lower part go away, but there comes a moment, and we've all experienced this in our life, that which is negative, that which is not serving us, that which may seem lower, again, it's not a judgment on anybody, that part automatically goes away. The darkness goes away when there is light. So when I move into a new shift, a paradigm shift of my thinking, I will no longer apply, I will no longer live in the way I was living because I come to that realization, oh, that behavior, that pattern, that response, that reaction did not serve me. It brought me pain, it brought pain to my brother or sister, and it doesn't serve me. And once I move into a deeper, you know, when I become more refined in my character, in my sensitivity, in my love for all of life and creation, that part automatically goes. You don't have to really struggle with it. Yeah, it takes time. Transcend that. Yes. The other thing I wanted to ask you, you used the word happiness. Can you give us a definition? Happiness is something that is already present within each one of us. We are seeking that in whatever we are doing. So happiness is a state of mind or heart that we arrive at through the transactions we do in this external world, but it is already a state that is present with us because it's always there. When we feel it, that happiness is something that was already there, but we were not conscious of it. We think we got it because of that external thing but we experienced it in our heart. And what gives you happiness may not give me happiness. So it's a state of being which is always present. But now and then, or a lot of times in some people, it's hidden. We don't know it. We're all seeking it through what we do. We all keep looking outside instead of inside. I have a question in terms of the practicality. If, yes. if somebody who's um, listening to us and, and watching us, and mm -hmm. let's say somebody says, uh, Boy, I wish I had that sense of happiness that she's describing. What would you say? I would say to them, are you willing to watch your own mind? Watch your own mind. All change can only take place if we start observing. 
I am capable because I know I was irritated, I was angry, I was mad. So what took away my happiness? And not analyze it, but watch and observe when am I truly happy? Because everyone has experienced this emotion of happiness and everyone wants that. So when they start observing, hey, I'm happy when I don't attach to an outcome of the situation. In a very simple way, I'm trying to just give it to you in a capsule. When I am not so dependent on another thing or another person for my joy, I seem to be freer. I seem to be more content. It's a subjective thing, of course. Let me, let me. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. How much of this understanding is cultural? How much of it is universal? I think all of it is universal. I mean, I grew up in a culture that's obviously different. You know, I'm not sure I was ever told. I mean, people know my history. I think we talked about it first. I mean, I'm a recovering drug addict. Mm -hmm. I did drugs because I didn't know how to live within me. I didn't know. I wasn't looking for happiness. I was looking, you know, I didn't think it existed. I was just trying to suppress the misery. It wasn't like I was trying to, you know, get high, so to speak. I was just trying to keep down all the stuff that was getting in the way, shut down my mind because it was just chattering all the time. I wanted to get rid of the toxic feeling in my gut. I wasn't looking for happiness. So that's why, that's why I'm asking you. How, you, know, you, you, you were from, looking to get rid of your sorrow. <laughs> Yes. What is that state when your sorrow is gone? It may not be, I'm not talking about a euphoric state of happiness. I am talking of that state when sorrow ceases to be. And that is that happiness. We may not know it in that way, but mm -hmm. we are all, everything seeks, and this is the premise of Vedant, which is completely universal. It doesn't say you have to change your religion. It's just a philosophy. Hinduism is practiced by anybody. And of course, you happen to be born Hindu. But the fact is, it is a universal fact that we all seek our true nature. The fish needs the water. The camel wants the desert. And instinctively, you put a plant, it goes towards the sun. So when I am attempting to remove my misery, because what am I attempting to feel? I'm attempting to feel, perhaps I don't know the meaning, but consciously, let me put it this way, the alcoholic, the drug addict, the saint, the sinner, whatever, everyone is seeking happiness, inner joy. And this is the teaching of Vedant, that in your essence, you are pure bliss. You are divine. All the other stuff, that you think I'm bad, I'm this and that, is because you're ignorant. You don't know the beauty within you. You don't know God present in your heart. You don't know that one energy that is in your heart beating as life is the same energy which has created this magnificent world. And that, of course, is the next step. But the first step is, how can I remove this sorrow? And... So we're all seeking the same thing. So the number one application that should come out of this show for anybody who is watching and listening then is happiness is achievable. Happiness is your nature. You are already free because who is observing all the emotions come and go? The one who is observing, and this is one of the approaches, all the emotions come and go cannot be the emotion. So is it possible for me to watch my emotion? Or is it possible for me to even by a little process of think of something I love, even if I can't connect with God, okay, that's too far for someone who's struggling with this. Think of something you love. Think of the beauty within you, you know, when you're going through that emotion and know that there is another space you can move into, even if it's for a moment. And then slowly it can be prolonged. Because if it's just for a moment, that's proof yes. that it's already there. And it can be 
it can be prolonged or it is, you can access it. You don't access it because your attention is turned too much outward. Your attention is making everything, you're interpreting things and making them so real that you're not able to look and see how many wonderful things are happening in your life. How talented, what a great being you are. You know, so each person is unique. There's no one like you. And the more and more you connect with that deepest part of who you are, which is pure, which is quiet, if left to yourself, you would be happy. Left to yourself with your, without your chattering mind, who are you? You are bliss, your freedom, your joy. I would have had a hard time with that concept back then. I want to just, I, I got to make a couple of announcements okay, and we'll, no we'll pick this back up. Those of you, and I can't believe there's anybody who's watching this who is not enjoying this and not getting a lot out of this. I got good news for you. Shivraji is going to be teaching at the Vedic Chan Center, which is at 901 West San Mateo Road. The number is 983-1781, extension 2. Monday, July 13th through Thursday, July 16th, there will be morning sessions from 7 to 8.30, and that's going to be on the Mandaka Upanishad. Then the following week, yeah, that's the following week, Monday, July 20th, and Tuesday, July 21st, and then the week after, which is Monday, July 27th, and Tuesday, July 28th, evening sessions from 6 to 7.30 on the Bhagavad Gita, which is Chapter 12, The Yoga of Devotion. All of these are free. Donations will be welcome and accepted. But, I mean, if, if you like what you're hearing now, don't get the abridged version. Go get the whole thing. Go show <laughs> up. Pack the house. It's really worth this it. This is the Reader's Digest version. Yeah, today. really. You know, remember the little... When I was growing up, I used to have to do these book reports, and they had the classic <laughs> comics. You get the picture version. I, I was great with that. So you want to be there. I will make this announcement again at the end of the show. Also, one other announcement. Immunity um, Santa Fe on July 17th, which is 7 p.m., they are having the spiritual cinema a movie called Tuning In, and it's about spirit channelers in America. Um, the film showcases six engaging American channelers and their non-physical counterparts. And so it's at Unity Santa Fe. The number for that is 989-3643, extension 3. Um, I've got a feeling that there's probably a fee for this, so call them, find out. And now, back to your regular show. <laughs> I'll just say that. Um, I, I, I love what you are saying, and I... I I agree with it so yes. totally. But really, I mean, I'm, I'm coming up on 22 years of substance free. 23 years ago, I would have looked at you like you were crazy. I would, I, I would not have believed that. There, there was no place that I knew where happiness was. I didn't believe in God. I didn't believe that I had the ability to be happy. I mean, the only reason... I stopped doing drugs because I was doing more and more of them and getting less and less out of them. It was an act of desperation. It wasn't an act seeking salvation. It wasn't an act seeking happiness. You know, so, I mean, I... I Not consciously, anyway. It sounds like there was part of you that was looking, as Subhadji said, to relieve yourself from your sorrow and to rediscover... Uh, something that maybe you didn't consciously say was happiness, but your soulfulness was attracted to because it would release you from your sorrow. This, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know what I was... Yeah, I, I was, It was an act of desperation. May I say something? Of course! <laughs> oh, there's somebody with us. <laughs> <laughs> what we are talking about is the optimal state. We have to start where we are. So when we are talking to someone who cannot even fathom what perhaps I was talking about a few minutes ago, we're not going to tell them, love God. They'll be confused. What God? We're not gonna, we have to start from where they are. So we have to start by telling them, you are lovable. Whatever their understanding of themselves is, not even the deeper part, the personality. There's something about you 
that is wonderful. When you see someone, when the person who is sad, who thinks that he or she is not good enough, when another fellow being recognizes them, and this again ties in with the teaching of Vedanta, that we are all one, that the life in me is the life in you, that when I begin to recognize that my source, this reality, we call it Brahman, the consciousness, and the source within you is one, and the source of this universe, there's a feeling. But coming back to talking to somebody who doesn't know all this, we don't start with this highest teaching. The teaching is always the same. We start by telling them, you are lovable. Yes. I love you, I accept you, right now just the way you are. Because even that person who is divine, who is happiness itself, right now doesn't know it. So how do we retrace them? We help them to get back to the beauty of who they are. So we don't start with the highest teaching straight away. We start with, you have some wonderful qualities. When they start getting a sense of love within themselves, of being loved and the sense of self-love, that they are something, that in spite of everything, there's something good about them, then slowly we can proceed to the next level. Two things, and we're going to move on from this. Yes. I love what you just said, because the first thing that I learned was that it wasn't even that I was lovable. Yes. It was that I might be able to get through a day without getting loaded. Right. Then the second thing you, it was beautiful. Exactly what you, they used to say, we will love you till you can love yourself. And that's exactly what you're saying. Well, because it's all from that spiritual teaching. Which is, I want to bring it right back to... to his Holiness uh, Chimayananda, mm -hmm. but the fulfillment of that can only be by living it with love. So, the, what he, and I think you've said this in another number of forms, but what basically is being said here, we can realize the truth through knowledge and contemplation, but if I ain't walking the talk, all that knowledge doesn't matter. I've got to demonstrate it. I've got to live and walk love as best as I can. It's not only that. Love is a natural, spontaneous expression once you have experienced this knowledge, and what is the knowledge? So going back to Advait Vedant, the philosophy of non-dualism, the philosophy of everything is one. If everything is one, consciousness vibrating at different levels, stone, inert level, plant, life, there is some mind, animal, little fully developed mind, but not intellect, human beings. All human beings have different thoughts and feelings, you know, emotions, but intrinsically it is the same energy vibrating at different frequencies. So if everything is one, and I don't have merely an intellectual knowledge of this through the scripture, through the Upanishads, through the Bhagavad Gita, but I begin to suddenly start feeling one with you. I transcend race, caste, creed, religion, everything. It's we are here. We are here in this one energy. Tell me, what is that one? Can it not be anything other than love? Love is connectivity. I love you means I feel one with you. I feel connected with you. I don't love you means separation. So separation is hatred. And yes. the whole idea, the greatest knowledge, and this is the knowledge of Vedanta, is that there is one reality only. And this is appearing as many. Don't get caught up in the name and form. Go to the heart. And so love, we have to live it. This knowledge of non-dualism, this knowledge of oneness, this knowledge of one consciousness is always only in thought and feeling and experience. But the expression has to be in love. It cannot be any other way. Then I'm separating. And like you said, walk your talk. Yes. Got a, something else you said, I just want to yes. clarify if I can. Will my vibration be higher when I'm praying and meditating than my vibration would be if I was doing drugs or alcohol? You give me the answer to that. Yes. <laughs> well, that's what I thought I heard you saying. That's why I asked the question. So that it's was what I think I said. simply when I am in a state of clarity, when I'm not agitated, when I'm not worried, let's take a simple thought. 
When I'm worried about the bills I have to pay, when I'm worried I don't trust anything, I don't trust God, I don't understand that there is a unity in all of life, you know. When I don't, then I'm going to be worried. When I'm worried, there is the life principle in me, which is intelligence, is not available to reflect through my intellect. And so it appears to be dim whenever there's agitation or worry. So naturally, when you have removed that, when there is clarity, you're not doing substance abuse, or you're not in the emotion of anger, or the emotion of attack. Mm -hmm. Your mind and your heart are so clear. At that time, naturally, you are vibrating. And now, you know, scientists can check this. Scientists can measure. There's so many conferences on consciousness, you know. They can actually measure what's going on. They hardwire you. They can measure what's going on when you're meditating, what goes on when you're praying, what goes on when you're angry. Mm -hmm. you know? I imagine just the very act of saying, I am observing my anger. Mm -hmm. I am observing myself as a uh, upset person. Mm -hmm. Increases our vibration. Just yes. the observation Absolutely. of that. So it is so simple mm -hmm. to say that I am not my anger. Mm -hmm. And to watch it. Yeah. And then it would, when it no longer is serving us or relevant or whatever, just... Or, if I can't bring myself to watch it, because that's what uh, mm -hmm. um, Phil is saying, that it's difficult, then we have to live by faith. Mm -hmm. Faith in something nobler, higher. We live, we say, okay, I have faith in my family, I have faith in my elders, I have faith in my country, my, my teachers, whatever. Mm -hmm. Something, man needs something, some noble ideal. So why not go for the noblest, the <laughs> highest, which is God, if you can? I'm not asking anybody you have to, but it's just a suggestion. That which is the source of the whole universe, the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, everything is going on. It is a cosmos. Of course, that CEO is doing a wonderful job. We have polluted the earth. So if I can hook on at that moment, if I can't observe, that is one method, as I said. But if I can at that moment surrender to, you know, offer that anger, that emotion at the altar of the noble ideal, in this case God, or even if it's not God, any higher noble ideal for the sake of my family, you know, for the sake of someone I love, I shouldn't destroy, I shouldn't be destructive with this anger. moment I surrender this very act of offering can also help, can also completely make that emotion dissolve and, and make me move into another state. And that could be the congregation that you pray Absolutely. and worship and meditate with. It's different approaches. The yes. truth is the same. The essence is the same. And that's the beauty of Hinduism recognizes. You know, it's called Sanatana Dharma, the eternal law, the eternal law of being. You know, that there is one reality, one consciousness, and that we all are one. It doesn't matter what name you call that state. I may say Krishna, you may say Jesus. This is how we feel. There is no separation. You are my brother and you are my sister. You know, you, you follow a different mode of worship. So what? All these paths, when you climb up the mountain from this side and you climb up from that side, when you reach up there, you may describe your path as something different. And that's why we acknowledge all the great masters of all the great religions. You know. One of my favorite lines is a Sufi master by the name of Rumi. Yes. And the line is, there's a thousand ways to kneel and kiss the ground. And that's exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And I try to use that line every show because there is no wrong way to do this. Yeah. In our, our masters, the rishis, you know, they say truth is one and the wise people call it by many names. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. it is. So let's get into some of the texts because that's what you're teaching at the Vedic Center this next couple of three weeks. Mm -hmm. um, you started touching in on the Vedas and the Upanishads. Do you want to elaborate a little bit more on them? Well, Vedas, again, they're originally and even now in Sanskrit. That was the language they were revealed. Veda, the word, 
comes from the root word in Sanskrit called vid, which means to know, to have knowledge of your own self, your deepest self, to have knowledge of your connection with consciousness, what is life. So Vedas are revelations, and they were compiled around 1500 BC into four different books. And the early portion of that book, uh, of those four books, deals with rituals, with karmas, with actions. And rituals are really used in Hinduism, in Vedanta also, as a means to quiet the mind. That's why we have so much ritual. And a means to purify, meaning make it quiet and alert and loving. A ritual makes our mind single-pointed. So when that mind is single-pointed, the end portion of each Veda book, there are four Vedas, Rig, Yajur, Sama, Atharva. The end portion of each book contains the mystical teachings called the Upanishads. Hmm. Upa means near. Shad means to sit, knee below. Sit near the teacher and a one on one, you dialogue with the teacher and that mystical revelation. So Vedas form not only the ritualistic portion, uh, they are lyrical chants. In the beginning, you'll find adoring nature because God is uh, the energy which is not seen. So the manifestation of that energy is the sky, the sun, the moon, the trees. So lyrical chants, adoring. And then later on, it becomes more refined. So that is the Vedas. And I will be teaching from this mystical portion of the Vedas, the Mundaka Upanishad. Now, I understand you took the four Vedas, but there are more than four Upanishads. Oh, yes. At the end of each Veda, you may find several Upanishads. And it is believed there are about 11 major Upanishads, which we normally study. There was 1,178, and of that, some 280 were recognized as you know, authentic and major. But 11 are the major Upanishads, textbooks, which we study uh, normally. I looked back on my notes from last year when you were here, and you were teaching the Mundaka Upanishad then too, as you are this year. Why did? Why are you choosing that one over no, and over? I to, uh, last uh, time I was teaching Katha Upanishad. Really? Yes. Okay, then my notes are <laughs> <That's not> okay. <laughs> accurate. <laughs> now I'm teaching Mundaka. It is another Upanishad. The theme is the same. The theme is this divine consciousness which is the very center of my being, life. And how do I approach it? And so different approaches where the student goes to the teacher and the teacher can only indicate this truth because you can't bring God in a test tube and show this is God. <laughs> you can only indicate through words that which is beyond words. So, so the Upanishad are Sanskrit uh, mantras, chants, but then we explain them in English in a very simple, very practical way of how we can connect to this energy which is within us, mm. which is everywhere. You know. If my notes are correct, which they're <laughs> which, subject to which not we're being... we're really not sure about anymore, Phil. My, I know that. That's why I'm, is I'm, I'm qualifying <laughs> each one of these. Um, it talks about two modes of knowing, so that the truth alone prevails, not on reality. Is that the basic? Yeah, that's one of the, the one line from this Upanishad. Yeah. But it, uh, it gives a different perspective from different ways. The teacher talks about what is this higher knowledge? You know? What is this higher knowledge that we are seeking? What is that knowledge knowing which everything is known? experiencing which, what is that state, experiencing which you gain a sense of fulfillment, contentment, joy. So in different ways, with different approaches, with different illustrations, it is shown how the gold, you know, gold and the gold ornament is one. If you see a gold ring, a gold chain, a gold bangle, they are, from the standpoint of the absolute reality, it is all gold. From the relative standpoint, it is a chain, a bangle, and a ring. How far is the chain from the gold? <laughs> so far are we 
from God. One and the same. I love that. Okay, that's good. Um, we're almost running down on time, so I want to try to get this in quickly. Then the other set of teachings is going to be the Bhagavad Gita, which is chapter 12, which is the way of love, um, the supreme importance of devotion and faith and spiritual development, as I understand that, that chapter. So do I understand the two things are connected? That, in other words, you're saying, you know, truth alone prevails and the best way to, and the only way to get to truth is through love and devotion. I'm saying get to it. Okay. Whichever way you get to it, through the path okay. of action, through the path of love, through the path of knowledge, it's all integrated. Get to that truth, Terrific. that which you are seeking, you know. And the Bhagavad Gita is a more uh, practical approach. How can I live? How should I be in a state of centeredness? And how do I connect? What is love? You know, how can I be closer and closer to the reality of who I am? I am this being of love, you know. I'm not separate from that. I'm not separate from God in my essence. I am one. It sounds like we've been exploring the, the essence of the Bhagavad Gita in our conversation. Yes, Bhagavad Gita and Upanishad. The Bhagavad Gita takes the philosophy of the Upanishad and puts it down in a very simple, practical way. So it is very interconnected. Okay. At this time of the show, <laughs> you're, you're getting warmed up, I can tell. <laughs> I'm thinking, it's, oh my goodness, how am I going to possibly encapsulate this? So you can do it. We have ultimate <laughs> faith in you. <laughs> in your own way. In my own way. Yes. Uh, yeah, the, the experience of sitting with you, Subhadri, and you, Phil, is reminding me of uh, that very question that you asked that was asked of our ancestors of old. Who am I? Which is the big question of the human being. And to ask that question, who am I, is to ask the question, what is the source? Who is the source of who I am, of what I am? And it's also to ask the question, how may I be happy? is a direct connection between self-identity, self-questioning, who I am, who am I, with happiness. And this is best known by finding the source. And as we've talked together, the way of finding the source is the way of love. And that's the call of your prophetic sensibility. That's the call of the source to us. And that means, in love, there is no separation. When we experience and extend love, we are experiencing and extending the very source. And we will find that we are indeed happy. That we are free from thinking that we are our anger. That we are all those things that we think we may be, but rather we can step back and observe them. And then we can let them go their way so that we can be free to be happy through love. That's what I feel sitting here with you. And if I feel that, it's true. Not because I am my feelings, but I have had this last hour to observe myself sitting here and recognizing, this feels fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy about that. Yeah. Excellent. Going to make a couple of announcements. Um, first off, every Monday night at uh, 6 o'clock to about 7.15 is a spiritual study group that I co-facilitate. It's at the... Vitamin Cottage Event Center. It is free. Donations are accepted. So anybody interested in discussing spirituality and various aspects of it in a little bit greater detail, please show up. Also, we invite you, the audience, to contact either John or myself. Um, you got questions, you want things we'd like to ask, and we can talk about it on the air. Let us know if that's what you want or you want a direct answer. 
Also, John and I are counselors, so if there's a problem with life and you think from listening to either one of us, we can help you. At the end of the show, there will be credits giving you contact information for both of us. Feel free to reach out and make contact. We're here to help. I want to remind you one more time that what you've gotten was the appetizer. If you want the main <laughs> course, you've got to show up. This woman, I mean, you cannot see how incredible, wonderful it is to sit with this woman, you know, like the Upanishad, sitting down near at the feet of the master. You got to be there. So the Vedic Chance Center, 901 West San Mateo Road. The phone number is 983-1781, extension 2. Monday, July 13th through Thursday, July 16th. They're morning sessions from 7 to 8.30, and it's on the Mundaka Upanishads. On Monday, July 20th and Tuesday, July 21st, and then again Monday, July 27th and Tuesday, July 28th. Evening sessions from 6 to 7.30 on the Bhagavad Gita, Chapter 12, The Yoga of Devotion. Again, these are free. Donations are welcome. Be there. You will benefit. Your life will grow in leaps and bounds. You do not want to miss this. Be there. Number again, 983-1781. And with that, I'll just take this quick and we can turn it over. Um, next week, we're going to do a little bit of social, spiritual application. We're going to have a group of people from Veterans for Peace, and we're going to talk about what that means and why it's important. So with the last couple of minutes we have, do you have a parting thought for us? The parting thought mm. is that as we become aware of the one life pulsating through everything and everyone, we will expand our heart, we will expand our awareness, and the only direction we can go is the direction and the place we are in, and that is love. In the end and in the beginning, everything that matters is love. Thank you so much, thank you. John, and thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank you. Now, this has been wonderful. I want to thank you all. Um, the original hippie, love. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was chasing that once, but I think I was chasing something else and it wasn't love. I don't think I knew what love was back then. Anyway, that's another show for another time. So until next week, know that you are one with everything around you. Know that you are one with God. Your job is to not let God in. Your job is to let God out. And all you have to do is want to do it. Yeah, but do you want to make the job easier? You got the information. <laughs> Go listen to this lady. I, I, I got to figure out how to clear my schedule and get there. And it's time. We're getting that famous signal. It's thank you all for tuning in. Love and light to everybody. Bye-bye. I'm Reverend Phil, and I've been your host for Words of the Prophets. Thank you for tuning in. Please join me again next week, same time, same channel, for more words of the prophets.